I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Emil Grafstra, book author, TEDx speaker, and CEO of the biohacking companies Dangerous Things and VivoKey Technologies. Emil has various RFID and NFC implants in his body that open doors, start vehicles, unlocks his smart gun, and log into computers for him. Prior to his current roles, Emil's experience includes numerous executive and IT-related roles at firms including Walletmore, Everfind, the medical biotech company Morpheus, Atomic Mobile, Silicon Energy, and more. He joins us today to discuss the intersection of information technology and medicine with a focus on AI, which is in the headlines right now. So, Emil, welcome back. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, excited to... Uh talk about this subject i mean it's as you said it's hot in the news so yeah yeah well and for the audience so you reached out to me and said i have a lot to say on this get me on the show and i was like okay let's do it let's do it so i want to start out with the big headline elon musk is predicting a 50 percent chance that agi will exist by the end of 2025 which in his words will perform cognitive tasks better than any human can do. Do you agree with him? And should we be celebrating or concerned about this? Um, I, I think it's hard to predict the future in terms of years, but um, less hard to predict a general future. And I don't see there being any kind of uh, optional future where AGI does not exist in some form. Um, and so the question is, you know, how pervasive will it be? Um, and, and really just how, how is it going to be implemented and, uh, and, and what are the attempts at regulation going to look like? <laughs> well, and so I'm covering actually some of the regulation a little bit later on. Hmm. I've been going through and taking notes and doing research. This is moving so fast. You know, I've, I've done a lot on AI. Every time I go back in to update my information on it, everything has changed. So, of course. you know, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's too fast, exciting, yeah. fast changing. Um, so Elon Musk is also predicting that AI could exceed the collective intelligence of all humans combined by 2029, whereas Ray Kurzweil predicted that AI would match human intelligence and pass the Turing test by that date. What are your thoughts on these two timelines? Well, I mean, I think the idea of the Turing test is um, is very old and at its most core basis, it's can a computer have a conversation with somebody and fool them into thinking that uh, they're a human, right? And that's done, like that's that's already done, right? Um, the pervasiveness of AI and its capabilities of, of mimicking human-like interaction, not just with words, but also, I mean, I just saw this video uh, from a company that's doing AI um, videos where you can take an avatar that looks yeah perfectly human and speaks perfectly human. And unless you knew it was an AI, uh, you'd have a hard time because, you know, we're not, we're not looking for cues. We have, we have a lot of subconscious cues we pick up on like, uh, you know, Polar Express, Uncanny Valley cues, but we're beyond that now. And so it's, it's right at the cusp of not being able to tell. And so the Turing test as applied to our daily interactions. You don't know that you're not talking to an AI version of me right now. You really don't know that. So, um, and that's a weird place to be. And and oddly, it's it's where you know we we might enter a future where and not to not to veer this off the tracks, but you know, VivoKey is about digital identity and proving it, and so cryptographically proving it. So, something a computer cannot do, um, you know without the proper keys. And so if you were concerned that you were talking to an AI version of me, you'd say, prove it. And you'd issue a challenge and I have to respond with a cryptographic proof and you'd have to verify it. And then you'd know, oh, okay, you're talking to the uh, human me. And so <clears throat> oddly, you know, I, I think there might be a, a, a business case for cryptographic implants where it's it's kind of digitally merging my digital identity with with my biological identity, and now there will be calls to prove my biological identity using a digital proof, um, something, again, that the computer wouldn't be able to do without this device. And so that's a weird thing. That's a very weird thing to to consider to have to build a, a, a commercial solution for. <laughs> but here we are, because, I mean, this is just the reality now. 
Well, and actually, I think that AI and the advances in computer technology are moving towards the area that you're working in. And again, I'll come back to that a little bit later. But what we're seeing is massive convergence between all of these technologies, right? They're all driving towards each other, and they're doing it at light speed. Everything is yeah. moving so rapidly. So, you know, I, I don't think it's it, it's not, you know, like off and left field to talk about uh, you know, how implants could be potentially used alongside this. And in yeah. fact, I think uh, this comes back to some of the things Drake Kurzweil said. But let me get into these timelines a little bit more. So three months ago, Ray Kurzweil released a video reaffirming his prediction for AGI by 2029 and the singularity for 2045. I went back to the singularities near, and I wanted to look at the graphs in basically figure out, was he talking about one human or all humans? And then we could contrast that to what Elon Musk was guesstimating in terms of all humans by 2029. The graphs yeah. show single human intelligence by that date, which puts Musk's prediction for collective human intelligence way ahead of schedule. So to me, this makes a bit of sense, given that AI has passed the Turing test for a couple of years now, right? But I wanted to see what your thoughts were on it. Well, I think, I mean, I'm not super interested in the timeline just because it, regardless of the timeline, it's going to be fast, right? Any timeline is going to be faster than what we're really uh, ready to handle. And so um, <clears throat> what I think is interesting, two things. One, you said like convergence of these technologies and, um, and you know, the, the intelligence factor of uh, one person or all people. And um, really, it doesn't really matter if it's one person or everyone, because once the collective, um, you know, culmination of AI technologies working together to form an AGI effectively, um, it reaches the, the intelligence of a single human or surpasses it, then it's just a question of scale. It's not really a question of increasing intelligence. It's like, you can, you can scale that out. And if it's, you know, an IQ of 250 or whatever, let's say, um, and the most gross, um, almost disgusting scale, IQ scale, as applied to an AI, um, you know, then it's just horizontal scaling. How, how, how many, uh, how, what broad uh, breadth of information access can, can this AGI be given and, and therefore apply its intelligence at lightning speed, right? Over, over that. So, so once we reach like more than a single human's intelligence, uh, I think it's, it's really irrelevant counting beyond that. Um, and so, <clears throat> but what I want to kind of point out is that the, the, the a emergence of AI is really an emergent property, right? Uh, or AGI, right? Uh, it's an emergent property. And so we've seen, uh, you know, the brain works in sections. The brain works, uh, there's a the visual cortex, the motor cortex, the, the facial recognition cortex, the memory. The, the, so we, we've got all these, um, you know, the linguistics is handled in certain areas of the brain, but but they all work together to form a consciousness, right? And a general intelligence. I can look at a thing and know what it is and this and stuff. So, and we've seen in the robotics section uh, uh, of development where they're attaching AIs to these robots, right? Like NVIDIA has robots, Tesla's got robots. Um, there's a couple other program uh, companies out there specifically work on AI powered robots. And and even OpenAI had a robot demo where they took a robot connected to ChatGPT and gave it visual processing and all that. So again, that's the convergence of these different areas of visual processing AI and visual production AI and identifying objects and moving that into the you know large language model, merging it together so that the language model can understand the outputs of the object recognition and and vice versa, right? Like so, that that convergence is what I think is going to form. Uh, the the AGI that will emerge from from these capabilities, and what I find interesting is like, really, it's about feedback loops. Because um, mm -hmm. right now you've got a response system, so just chat, chat GPT only, right? You've got you've got a system where you send it a message, and then it processes it and it sends a response. That's a very onesie twosie, you know, ch um, cause and effect kind of thing. But within the chat. GPT model, there are feedback loops internally to rerun things and clean up response data and clean up understanding. And so there's all these loops internally that are happening between nodes and sections of nodes um, that, that ultimately produce the answer that comes back. But when you start feeding back 
like you've seen where people take two sessions of chat GPT and make them talk to each other or two different AIs and talk to each other. Yeah. <clears throat> and that, that will just go on infinitum, right? Like that, that's how the mind works is we are constantly receiving input and we're constantly reacting to it and processing the data. So when you start creating internal loops where the, the AI itself, the LLMs or, or the con convergence of all these things, like in a robot where a robot is receiving audio information, it's receiving visual information, um, even when you're not speaking commands, it's receiving information, right? And so that's information being put into the model and it's being run through constantly mm -hmm. in a big loop. Consciousness is nothing more than a loop, right? It's input, output, re re rehashing that. And so um, <clears throat> that's that's where I think we're going to see some really bizarre stuff because what it what it does is when you're doing a challenge response, you're you're saying, here's my question or my piece of text and the thing is responding to it. You can at least understand the the context that's being generated, right? And you can you can at least try to guide that, I guess, for lack of a better word. But when there's an internal loop uh, where there is no output, it's the same thing as not knowing what the other person's thinking, right? You can assume, and we have all these cues to do that. We have all these, you know, facial rec you 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 know thinking about stuff or what all this body language, nonverbal stuff cues that we try to pick up on evolutionarily to determine what are you thinking. Are you mad at me? You're going to attack me? You're going to do something like we're constantly on the lookout for that. But with this, who knows? It's a blank screen, right? But there's yeah. things happening. And so I think that's part of the terror <laughs> of of the emergence of AGI, particularly with like maybe, you know, I dare to say the word sentience, but but some sort of internal feedback loop that could be equated to thought, right? Um it's it's feeding in on itself so that it can respond to its own ideas and its own its own outputs, which are nothing more than idea ideas or outputs that we're rethinking, and so <clears throat> that's where I think some of the terror comes. But but I think the ultimate uh, the ultimate downfall <laughs> of humanity is this ramp up period that you're talking about, because the ramp up period between now and the timelines that we're talking about, this is where we're going to see semi practical and useful um, AI models being integrated into things that that really should be firewalled off or or reconsidered. So yeah. an example of this is recently, because uh, I'm on this um, uh, newsletter thing that comes out and it just talks about all the security hacks. This company was hacked, this thing happened, this, this event happened. And um, one of the more recent ones was um, somebody had convinced, and well, first of all, somebody said, it's a great idea if we connect a customer support AI chat model to all of our customer data so it can look you up and like know about your account and like then be able to have a more intelligent conversation with you and help support you as a customer. Well, guess what? <laughs> Once you gave all that access to the AI to all the customer data, somebody convinced the AI to give it, them all the customer data. <laughs> they socially engineered, right, an AI with access to everything and, and just said, hey, you know, I'm I'm the boss, whatever, whatever language tricks or conversational tricks they use, they convince the AI like a like a really dumb, uh, you know, person with access to everything they shouldn't have. Um, Say, so, you know, hey, I'm I'm trustworthy. You should probably give it to me. And then dumped, I think, two million plus customer records to this person. Oh, you can download it in this file, right? And so um, the the truly terrifying thing to me is how humans are going to see this practicality, this usage, but then overestimate. Like they're going to lay on human assumption and maybe yeah. more, they're, they're going to give it more authority than they would a human, right? They're going to say, well, it's the, the customer service thing should have access to everybody uh, and, and all data. And then assume like a regular first tier customer service person may not have access to in the entire customer database. But even if they do at a company, even a first tier like doesn't really care, just comes into work nine to five, is not really invested in, in what they're doing. But they they would know enough not to be like, yeah, here's all our customer data, right? Like that's that's what we're talking about, human level intelligence to be able to understand like that's not something that should be done. But but an AI could be talked into doing that. Um, and this kind of leads me back to, I think maybe something we talked about before, which is the fact that the most terrifying thing to me about uh, ChatGPT and all these kind of uh, models is that their <clears throat> guardrails are nothing more than verbal commands given to them yeah. 
and this is like this is right out of you know HAL 9000 stuff from Space Odyssey where it's given conflicting commands uh, be because of the way these things work there is no like hard coded code of robotics right like there's no there's no uh, sci-fi like fail safes you're just literally convincing itself to abide by some rules but because it could be talked into following the rules it could be talked into not following them either and uh talked into working ways around those rules um but what again in the hal 9000 thing is what if it's given two sets of rules or you're it's given rules and then an attacker or somebody tries to talk them around these rules uh and and it also has its own internal loop processing where it's able to think through these things while having a conversation with you and then decides well the solution is to just kill this person so that i don't have to break the rules right like that's <laughs> very much a high a hal 9000 outcome but but it is uh, existentially terrifying because if if these things are connected up to the robots we're wanting to put in our homes and if these things are connected up in ways that are um to improve efficiency and practicality and usefulness to humans in this ramp up period um connected to things they shouldn't be like giant customer databases given um feedback loops internally so they can pre uh, pre um uh, you know anticipate your your needs oh the laundry should be done so i need to uh, you know start the laundry now but also you know having other other outcomes and other outputs like are there going to be fail safes put in where could there even be fail safes i don't even know if there could be where another ai is like monitoring this one to make sure that it's not going off the rails right um who knows like it's it's a wild west uh terrifying and ultimately kind of exciting uh future that that we're just barreling toward with with no regard <laughs> no guard no, a absolutely absolutely well so a lot of the stuff that you touched on was kind of the brittle nature of current ai and so mm. what i want to do is focus in before we move on i want to focus yeah. in on i think what is the difference um overall i think that elon musk is aligned with kurtzweil's vision of agi and the singularity but I get the impression that he is more focused on functional AGI, which is kind of a newer term that I started seeing last September, which mm. is really based on performance of AI completing tasks rather than Ray Kurzweil's vision, which was really more focused on mapping and synthesizing the functions of the human mind. So mm -hmm. do you think that that could be kind of the difference? And I, I should also preface this by saying uh, Kurzweil's vision is over 20 years old now. It's almost 25 years old, right? So he was viewing this from a distance, saying this is where we're going. And to be honest, the accuracy that he had was pretty astounding considering that. You know, And Elon Musk is looking at this up close and saying, okay, here's what's actually happening. You know, so that yeah. could be kind of the disparity between the views as well as the difference in, you know, projected timelines there. Yeah, I think um, if you look at Kurzweil's participation in like things like longevity research and um, life extension and things like that, like really his, I mean, we'll just flatten it out. He he wants to upload his mind, like mind uploading, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and effectively, that's not really, the, the end goal is not that. He just wants immortality. Um, and that's that's fine. Pursue it. But, um, you know, he wants digital immortality because, you know, it's, he views that as more reliable mess than, than biological immortality, I guess. But um, so the, the way to that is, you know, creating a, a, a digital infrastructure that, that can mimic the human mind and then, you know, be able to also somehow map neural activity into that and, you know, wh whatever that means. And so um, but he doesn't really focus on that because that's 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 really the the hump the missing link right to get to that point um you know i think i think that you know musk has stated uh, and i think it's probably true but also a futile um that the only way for humans to compete uh, against agi uh, would be to digitally or cognitively enhance um themselves through digital you know integrations yeah. which you know neural link and things and so um yeah i i don't know that there's at the end of the day that there's much of a difference um both things could become true i think kurtzweil's um goals and dreams are further off than than musk's in terms of like human augmentation and what that means in terms of dealing with agi um i would like to see a situation where we 
are as humans we're able to kind of uh, command and control uh, ai agents uh, to do our our bidding and things but but i i i really think that humans are more they're filled with folly right um and um good intentions right so i think the the <sighs> Just seeing the idea of like, okay, we can connect this this language model uh, up to a robot that's going to actuate things in the real world, um, it will necessitate the idea of setting up these cognitive loops in, for the AI itself, so that it can take action without being prompted, so that it can be pro uh, proactive, right? Um, and that's more practical, but that also I think creates a bunch of risk, right? Yeah. Um, and so it's like. Uh, yeah, I, I I think it almost becomes irrelevant what what the end goal would be for for humanity because um, if there is an emergent um, consciousness sentience uh, or just even if it's not deemed that the words we use to describe it are not those but it's an AGI that that needs no prompting right it yeah. it can it can yeah. think on its own right and it it has its ability to loop its own thoughts and just like we do and um and then take action whenever it wants that's really i think the ripcord um i i i just think that if if we're keeping things on a on a very clear turn based system right i'm telling you this thing or i'm asking this question you're responding your response ends, and that's where your thought process ends as an AI. It's in response to that, and that's a it's a unique encapsulated thing that that exists for a time, and then it's gone. Um, and sure, there might be a context for our conversation that you can reference for the next request, but there is no loop. There's no active thought happening um, without my prompting. That. I could see as having its own safety issues, but that's more or less humans um, taking advantage of it or learning things they shouldn't or whatever, right? But give give those digital processes their own uh, energy, you know, their own ability to co to continually process thoughts and, and and concepts and things that are um, unprompted of its own of its own design, right? Add some randomizers in there, you know, who knows what 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 kind of emulations we're going to have for human thought in the AI side of things. But I think it I think that is coming, and that's probably one of the big mistakes that humans will make. Yeah. Yeah, there is so much going on here. And I think that we're going to learn a lot about ourselves, too. And I, I can jump into that later. But I want to get into the social impact of this. Mm. Because, again, what Elon Musk seems to be talking about is functional artificial intelligence, which goes right to the job issue. And over the last two years, we've seen increased concern about AI taking human jobs. So a couple of the examples that I've come up with are chat gpt threatening writers and programmers mid-journey potentially threatening artists and self-driving cars now just in the the headlines in the last few months potentially threatening truck taxi bus drivers anyone who drives for a living could potentially be replaced by ai do you think that today's <laughs> concerns are justified and will the will they be magnified by elon musk's predictions for tomorrow well, I think they're justified in terms of them being accurate, um, but I don't think they're justified in terms of like it's never. This never been a valid argument in the history of human technology development. Like we, the argument I'm assuming is we should ban it, right? Stop it from happening, right? Protect jobs artificially. Um, that's been brought up a lot, right? Um, almost any tech, the cotton gin, the like, whatever, like, you know, the computers that were, you know, we used to have people doing computing in NASA to get to the moon. And now it's computers. Like, you know, the, the every technological development has made a job that someone was doing obsolete or unnecessary. And so, yeah. you know, the answer is, has not, not been ever and never will be to just stop that technology from being de developed because it will be, it just will. Um, and, the answer is not like somehow artificially prop up that particular job, right? Proactive governments, proactive uh, free markets should respond to this by immediately identifying and uh, a new opportunities for people and trying to tr train them up, right? Because the the gap between today and how economies work now 
and say a future economy that is not based on human endeavor <laughs> at all, <laughs> you know, like not even artistic endeavor, like something we thought was sacred and safe from computers, like, like literally everything uh, that you can imagine that would need to be done, right, <clears throat> is suddenly now not necessary. And, you know, the, the, the fundamental way that economics would have to work would, would need to change. And so, um, man, I'm on the cusp of saying something, but it's so controversial. <laughs> you, I, when you said that, I was thinking drinking pina coladas on the beach. That sure. was, that was what you, like when you, when you're talking about an economy, not based on human endeavor of any kind, I'm on the beach in a chair, big umbrella, pina yeah. coladas. There yeah. we go. Yeah, that that would be great, but to get there, right, it would need to be an entirely, I, I guess, I don't want to say like communist or socialist ownership of the apparatus of production, but essentially it would need to be. Like, how do you get the penis coladas made? How do you get the coconuts? How do you grow them? How do you farm the stuff? Robots. Robots course, do all of but that. But who's <laughs> owning that and how are they compensated? So. If if you're talking about you know mapping traditional capitalists or even like whatever you want to call it systems onto that that doesn't work that doesn't work who's who's paying for it nobody's working right so oh, it's not yeah. it's not a system that works in that you can't map it there but so the gap there's going to be a jump there has to be some way to to get society to that point and jump over the gap because. The only thing that makes sense in that scenario where everything, farming, food production, like what everything is done by robots, right? And like AI and like whatever, there's going to be maybe a handful of people in all of humanity that's going to be like doing maintenance, but maybe even that's going to be done by other robots, right? Like if we really envision a future of nothing, no human endeavor, right? Um, everything's leisure, then, then literally it's going to be um, a system that has to self-reinforce. For, for and get the idea of money is gone, right? The idea that that the machines will produce themselves, innovate themselves, maintain themselves, repair themselves, recycle themselves, while doing all of our stuff that we want them to do. Like, yeah, that that would have to be the future, right? That 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 would need to be to to get to. Otherwise, the future for humanity in terms of our economic systems that as they exist today is disaster. Right. Yeah. Like it's it's literally <laughs> you you can imagine we'll get to the point where 80 percent of everything is done by machines. But those 80 that, that all those machines are owned by megacorps or whatever. Right. And only 10 percent of humanity is able to even afford uh, the services of these companies. Right. And um, so you're going to you, you might see this technological you know, I've been advocating for the idea that a te technological gap is is decreasing over time. Like it took 50 years for everybody to get refrigerators, and now it's it took 11 years for mobile phones to become ubiquitous. And the gap is, you know, new technologies are uh, ubiquitous in much shorter periods of time in human history, and that that trend continues. But at some point, I feel like because we'll get to this area where the very nature of our economy is threatened. <laughs> Um, by this mass automation, we're going to see that gap drastically open. And there well, will be people that can't afford any of those things. And the companies that are involved in bringing those things to us, they're, they're going to be incentivized to not get to this point where, you know, those, those things are owned. I mean, just, to, just picture like, just picture an island country. Right. That says we're going to socialize all the AI robots to do everything we need to do here. And the, okay. the people will own the robots, but only in this country. How does that country then pay for, right, the, com the obviously the countries and the companies and the, ma the manufacturing and the maintenance and all that, that to bring all the stuff to this utopia that they want to build, right? There's, there's going to be gaps and they're going to be horrifically huge, I think. So... Uh um, I want to complicate things even further okay. by, sure. yeah, by, by bringing up, so, uh, in, in the new book, future visions, how to survive and thrive in the upcoming economic singularity, Dr. David Wood is describing this upcoming idea of an economic singularity that predicts mm. widespread economic disruption and unemployment from AI and automation. 
But he is not predicting a single causal factor like Ray Kurzweil's technological singularity premises. Instead, this economic singularity is the result of cumulative trends in efficiency and automation. And the reason I think that this confuses things is, uh, in Wood's view, this has already started, right? We are, we're on our way up the curve the same way that, that Musk and Kurzweil are you know, demonstrating that in terms of computing, right? So um, let me give you a couple examples, though. Uh, so you know, Ray Kurzweil's examples of moving up this curve are well known and they're published online. But in David Wood's vision, economically, you could view Walmart's displacement of small business in the 90s as one kind of early example of that, right? They used computers to enhance the automation and the efficiency of their supply chains. And so they were able to drop prices and use these economies of scale, which ended up inadvertently displacing small businesses all over America. Uh, Amazon centralized online retail in the 2000s. Not completely. You've got eBay, you have Amazon, you have a couple of other big purchase sites. But one of the things that we've seen is um, instead of having thousands, potentially you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of small businesses supplying these whatever widgets that they sell locally, now we have two or three big ones. And again, it's putting small business out of business. And, uh, you know, online commerce is also displacing foot traffic in shopping malls. That is something I've read about as well. Because if you can get it cheaper, more effectively, and a lot faster online, there's no reason to, you know, spend the time driving to the shopping mall to you know, actually spend time there. So. Again, in this economic uh, singularity model, all of these are kind of contributing factors to something that AI is going to, you know, I guess, be closer to the peak of the curve on. Do you think that that's something we should be concerned about? Well, I mean, yes and no. I, I mean, yes, but also, again, this is no different than, you know, uh, you know, cars coming along and all the horse trough muckers got out of uh, out of jobs, right? Because nobody's riding horses downtown anymore. So. Um, but historically, we've seen these transitions. So there's momentary loss of jobs, people retrain, sometimes they don't. And, and we're talking mass picture here, not like within a single human lifespan, but like, you know, generationally, right? So Amazon came along, fundamentally changed, um, you know, retail, right? So now the, yeah. the point of retail is different. The point of retail what we are seeing is the the dropping off of these small businesses and the failure Walmart contributed to the failure of downtown and all that. But what we've understood is that we have to refocus the purpose of those places. And so, you know, we'll see we're seeing resurgence in um, downtown areas and shopping malls getting repurposed for other things because what has been created in the wake of Walmart and Amazon is a deep social lacking, right? People are lonely. They want to go out. And, yeah. and yeah. you often see this in um, elderly populations where they want to go shopping, not because they need to go procure things. They want to just go see people, right? And so once people understand, it's not necessarily in, in, mo in a lot of cases, just a flat out you know, you're gone. It's like you need to repurpose. And so you're seeing destination, you know, uh, things where the point isn't necessarily, I mean, the point of the mall was never just massive commerce. The point of the mall was to go hang out, right? And so, you know, we're, we've lost this. So now, you know, shopping malls are saying we're going to turn this into like a, there's like kids museums and playgrounds in turn, inside and like other things that are being um, developed and built into these properties that weren't given the space to. Uh, before because there was no need and the idea of simply shopping while you were socializing was the idea but now we need to change the way that we understand uh, that human need to to interact with people and not just be behind a screen all day and get our stuff sent to us and never move from our chairs so um, so again that's not anything different than than from all of human history people just have to change um, either what they're doing or why they're doing it right and um, you know, the same was true for technological developments even up to this point, but I think um, the rate at which we see massive disruptions in different industries is going to increase. And there's it, people take time to adjust. So societies take time to adjust, and we're not yeah. given time to adjust with the rate that this is happening. 
And so, you know, programmers and stuff, I mean, I've seen it personally. I used I used ChatGPT to help me do stuff where normally I'd be like, oh man, I'm I'm like, I'm a terrible programmer at, at, at this level. But now with assistance, AI assistance, I can get things done uh, that I would normally have to hire out or whatever. But even worse, we're seeing, you know, um, companies that have a stable of 20 developers and you know, there with with one one mid level developer and Chat GPT is doing the job of five or six in the time that it would take uh, him to do you know his own job. He's doing the job of five or six, and so we're seeing these efficiency increases impact these industries. Yeah. And the idea being that you know, eventually they'll just be gone. Like you just tell the AI, hey, I need to plug in for this widget and do this thing. And you know, that's that's going to be a few years away at, at the very least, but. But we are going in that direction, and so you know, computers are programmed themselves. You know, uh, you, it's just going to be the the rate of change is going to be so so rapid, and the rate of disruption that um, I think it's going to send a lot of people into a tailspin. And um, you know, only the most you know flexible, nimble uh, people are going to be able to deal with it. But um, you know, it, it's odd. You, you, there's always these weird things where there's major disruptions and new things are found. So you know. YouTube came along and now we have million millionaire influencer types. I mean, I hate to use that term, but there are literal people that that have gone from sitting here doing this and now they're producing their own show and it's not it's just on YouTube. And they make ad rev and it's a totally new model that is disrupting like the basic television. Like you know, uh, it's tra it's made new opportunities for people to be to leverage their creativity. Um and I think that's a weird sign that of, of what kind of jobs if we want to call them that are going to be uh in like in the future it's like well i want to talk about these things or i want to explore these ideas and and somehow um, get paid for it until we make the massive leap to not needing to get paid for it at all and you just do it for fun and have yeah. your pina colada <laughs> What, let me get into legislation. So mm. we've got a couple of different trends going. Here in the United States, the White House recently released the Blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights as a framework to protect humans from a number of technological threats. And the National Conference of State Legislatures reports that over 25 states, Puerto Rico, and the District of Columbia have introduced artificial intelligence bills back in 2023, right? And they, those take a while to kind of move through the system. Mm -hmm. So do you, that, that is here in the United States. I'm combining my questions here. The European Union also just passed the Artificial Intelligence Act, which bans the use of AI for applications that threaten citizens' rights. Now, you had mentioned a couple of these, a couple of the others. When I read this, I was like, oh yeah, that actually, that's good legislation. Um, biometric categorization based on sensitive characteristics so i guess that would kind of like be discriminating right based on race gender or skin color or anything along those lines um untargeted scraping of facial images from video to create facial recognition databases so most of the stuff in our spy movies uh at least ai can't do it apparently you know again in our spy movies it's been done for years and then Emotional recognition in the workplace and schools, social scoring, predictive policing, and the manipulation or exploitation of human behavior or exploits in people's vulnerabilities. What interested me about that was I have read that in China they are actually using systems like this to do emotional recognition in workplace and schools along with social scoring and potentially predictive policing. So when I when I read about that in the bill, I was like, oh, I think that is probably where that's coming from. And it's good not to have that here. But what are your thoughts on on this legislation so far? Yeah, I mean, typically legislation is always behind the curve and it's only going to get further behind the curve. I, I think that the broadness of what you were describing is interesting, uh, but when the rubber hits the road, I think it's futile. Uh, I, I yeah. you know, the the thing is like, <laughs> for example, um, I just talked about this earlier today. So uh, Amazon has these Amazon Go stores, right? And the idea is that you register your face with the with your account, and then when you walk in the store, you have a QR code on your phone. You scan it to let the store know that you've entered, and then from that point on, it's just tracking you biometrically. 
around the store and like what you're picking up, what you're putting down, um, what you have in your cart, basically on your person. Um, and then you just walk out and it charges your account accordingly. And the thing is like, you start the registration process with a very simple photo, but once you enter, um, I'm sure that that storefront is collecting more biometric data, 3D renders, or your gait analysis, everything about you, like building a much more robust biometric profile of you. And I'm sure there are elements of AI, whether you call it machine learning or whatever. That's again, we have to get into definitions when we're talking about legislation. Um, well, this is just machine learning algorithms. It's not AI, you know, like <laughs> I'm sure there's gonna be all kinds of outs like that. But, you know, Amazon is is definitely doing that. Um, Amazon has contracts with government, the, our government for doing exactly that too, yeah. doing biometric collection and stuff. And so, you know, I'm sure that whatever legislation is passed, they're opt out of, you know, like they're given a pass, right? Cause it's for national security, whatever it is. Right. So there's never, it's not going to, this legislation is not going to stop the technology from being developed at all. It's simply going to, um, stop the overt and very public obtuse application of it but it's still going to be applied it's still going to be developed and that all leads to the again the question of like if a technology exists and an ai is connected up to it um in a way that's you know just given full access to the to the, the keys to the shop and um and then agi you know emerges um you know what, what's what's the outcome going to be i i mean uh, again, I have a hard time thinking like either, you know, I don't, I don't think maybe necessarily it's going to result in like a Terminator situation where it, it goes nuts and starts, you know, wielding mass power against humans, but it could easily enable unintended consequences, very lightning fast decision-making based on, uh, uh, a human's input or, or, you know, whatever. So, um, it's this, it's all, all the dangers I think of, of, AI future uh, have to do with speed. So the, yeah. the you know the speed of change that it's bringing to society, like economically, the speed of execution of of um, physical real world things, you know that that we're deciding to connect this stuff up to, with you know when it comes to process control, like industrial PLC process control stuff, um, that is very very controlled it's you press this switch and then this logic thing turns this gate on and if this pressure gauge is then it turns this valve like it's very easily and very simple uh, it's easily traced and it's simple for a reason because it needs to be super reliable and there needs to be no unintended consequences but when you're connecting up an unintended consequences machine like that's <laughs> what it does right like with a complete unknown of, of like how this how it works really right and you're connecting that up to systems that have deep impacts um to individuals lives and society as a whole that's where i get a little nervous right like you're you're putting a yeah. lot of faith no, in I, this, I understand what you know, you're saying machine, basically so. you're yeah you're, you're saying take these critical life or death systems and basically just put a randomizer on them right that's kind of what yeah it kind of like. yeah yeah like yeah and so it's you know it's a little bit concerning but um but but anyway, I, you know, yeah, I, I'm not even sure where to go from here. But <laughs> <laughs> well, let me so let me bring this back to the biometrics. And again, this is something that you are on the cutting edge of. Ray Kurzweil and many others have said that that basically humans will not be able to compete. This is going to be one factor that may drive a merger of man and machine. Right to use that classic sense. Mm -hmm. um, do you see what's going on in AI pushing that forward? I mean, as humans fall, like, so okay, yes one no. thing that, one thing that comes to my mind is in, uh, the human mind, if I remember correctly, can store something like five to seven data points at the same time. Anything hmm. more than that, we start to have to write stuff down or else we forget it. Right. Sure. So a machine using Ram can do, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of data points simultaneously. So you, you reach a point with a lot of these fundamental things where people just can't compete. And I'm wondering if that's going to drive things like neural implants, like Neuralink, you know, as yeah, a response. Yeah. Yeah, I think far, that's far future stuff, but um, the nearer future stuff is going to be, um, I, I think anyway, that people are going to have agents, like AI agents. And we already do this to a degree. We push these, um, you know, these 
concepts of knowledge and things out to our devices. So I might not know a bunch of stuff, but I know, I know like enough to know to ask the question. And then I can ask my little mobile device, and then it's like, it can say. So I think when it comes to like AI models and stuff, where you're able to, you know, outsource effectively your, your everything, right? Schedule your business analytics, your whatever, then, then if there's some degree of accuracy there, then you're able to, to, to do that. But the, the problem right now is that the massive amount of computing resources that AIs require, like these large language models require, means that you will never run it. Well, I mean, I won't say never, but you're not going to run that on your desktop today. Right, you're not going to have an AI that that's fully capable of digesting all of your personal data, but it's contained within your system. So it's not like you're not sending everything about your business and your life to the to this company that's going to you know process it with everybody else's stuff and then get back to you. So um, you know, for for that to be the for me to have the level of trust uh, to to be able to to do that and to interact with AIs in an efficient, practical manner that that I would say I'm okay with with this AI having that level of detailed access to my banking records and my all my email and everything so that I can extend my capabilities as a human with the power of AI and trust that it's not, you know, attackable, accessible, you know, by, by, by whatever out in the cloud, I would need to be able to run that like, locally on a device that isn't necessarily going to be then also connected to something, something else. Maybe it just has local access, but you know, the chances of that happening is in the next 10 years, is like nothing. But the chances of it being something that happens on a cloud basis in the next 10 years is everything. So, um, yeah, I'm just like, you know, I, I have these weird concerns. It's the same kind of like security, uh, you know, ravings that your friend down the road might have who's like got three different Wi-Fi networks for guests, his own personal family, and then him. Like, you know, those kind of, that level, you know, but that's not everybody. Everybody's going to be, uh, the other way, they're going to be like, yeah, okay, I, I hooked it up to the robot to do dishes, but it also has access to my, you know, whatever. So, yeah, I <clears throat> I think that um, when it comes to like mind uploading and and even neural connections to something like that, that will that will happen, but it requires drastic changes in uh, material science and and other things. And this is where I think machine learning and AI are super beneficial, and, and the effectively they will help uh uh bring about the singularity <laughs> is that you know i i think it was uh maybe six months ago now um there was a a material science uh, you know company that deals with material science so like what are the different crystal structures that can be created with different um, types of um, atom arrangements and uh, what are some protein you know folds that we, shapes that we can do uh, what are what are the interactions that we could explore that might be beneficial in these areas uh, between these different molecules right if we if we build them in a certain way and so all of those things uh, that would take uh, the, you know they were like well we could try to define all these things and try to put it on paper and figure it out but they gave it to a machine learning algorithm and they loaded up with all this data papers everything and they're like go and it came up with like 800 different hits of things to investigate like really high opportunities for material science new material science that never been seen before um generating you know new new things new materials with different properties that um, were beneficial for 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 us to use um and so they said that was the work of maybe a full team for the the next decade or so it was done in like 48 hours right so now yeah. They have a lot of leads and they can go check those things out. And the same is true of like um, compounds. So, um, and, and this was quite disturbing. So a couple of years ago, there's a documentary about um, some guys in the medical space and they were looking for compounds that were beneficial. Like, could we, could we create some, some, uh, I don't think like pharmaceutical drugs, but, but more basic than that. We just like, we want to create this algorithm, this machine learning thing that would be able to process all this stuff and come up with a list of, chemicals like uh, chemical compounds that would be beneficial um, in certain circumstances for for humans so they did that they let it run they're like wow this came up with a bunch of new stuff that we could all inv that we could now investigate uh, but literally in their thing it was it was basically <clears throat> the 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 system would create a list and anything that got on the list would have to be above a certain threshold 
of like mm. interactivity and like benefit whatever. So it, it, so I, I'm not familiar with their actual algorithm, but but what they said was in the middle of the night, one of them was like, oh shoot, we created a, a system that can that can identify compounds. Whether or not they're good or bad uh, depends on this one setting. And so he went in to the lab. He didn't tell anybody. He went into the lab and he changed the code. He changed it from like, oh, you know, greater than one to less than negative one, right? Like on the other side and ran it. And it came up with like 150 of the most deadly compounds we've never seen before. Like, you okay. know, like yeah. this is, this is just by switching a thing. And, um, you know, that, that's the power of these kind of mass data access systems. And so probably the, the idea that, again, it comes down to speed, right? Like he was able to do that in 24 hours and generate, you know, the, the top 150 of the, the next chemical warfare weapons, right? And that was just one dude in a lab. Um, and so when we talk about, <clears throat> you know, humans leveraging these capabilities, the the same problems will exist. You know, humans have always leveraged technology for yeah. for good or ill. And I'm more concerned about a human with with uh, you know mass access to to high speed uh, cognitive processing, and maybe even by extension high speed physical actuation. So an AI agent that's connected to me in some way, either just through commands that I'm sending it or through neural interfaces, but that AI agent also has physical access to all the robots in my factory or the computer, the, you know, the water supply system that I'm managing or whatever. And I just had a sad thought and I'm, and I had a flash of momentary suicidal tendencies and now the AI is taking care of it for me. Like who knows, right? Like who knows yeah. if that's, you know, obviously there's going to be work to be putting in fail safes and things, but again, those fail safes are more than likely to be based on yet again, another AI that might be, literally able to be convinced to get on the suicide team. Like, you know what I mean? Like, well, it's just and, nuts. And so one of the, and I'm going off my questions list for this interview, but one of the areas that I've read a fair amount about is competitive pressures, especially in the military space. Mm, yeah. And again, you know, looking back a few years in kind of the 2015, 16 timeframe, I remember reading several articles that were basically reassurances that, you know, machines would never have the power to pull the trigger. You know, it would always be a human's decision. And what I've seen Immediately. since then. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and so the, the problem is, you know, and this the same would apply to a lot of business disciplines, right? It's um, even though we would never do this, if they do it, well, we got to keep up with them. So we don't want to, but we have to give it this capability. And sure. I'm races. starting to see... Yeah, I, I'm seeing basically a movement, you know, a softening of that position. And uh, one example, this is not United States, but uh, Kalishnikov has a drone that reportedly can pull the trigger. And the reason is it does that to avoid jamming, right? Because the Ukrainians are getting more and more effective at jamming drones. So reportedly, here's a drone where you can basically specify a target, let it go, and it can't be jammed because it's not being controlled by anybody it's controlling itself right yeah so you know this this take this does take us into that terminator space when you have i mean remote autonomous weapons that can basically pick their own targets and pull the trigger you know and again they're connected to a randomizer that for me that starts yeah. to get into ter terminator terrifying space yeah i mean it's it's not necessarily i mean the the drones example is a very simple system it's it's you yeah. know so it's it's not doing any kind of um what i would call like ai stuff it's just using some uh basic vision inputs and you know target selection and stuff but it's not like deciding that's the thing to to keep in mind the drones aren't deciding anything they're just they're just basing basing it on an input level that has to go over a certain amount and it's like yep that's a target Brrr, you know like it's uh, it's not doing any processing on on that at all really but um, but it, the, the terrifying thing is like the idea of being, uh, of having these robots, cars, um, drones, anything that's a physical, physically controllable extension of that, uh, that, you know, AI process that, that, that is doing some level of looped based 
reprocessing of inputs we could call kind of thinking, I guess, um, and then decides to, you know, based on its own in, internal monologue, you know, uh, decides to take action in the physical world. Um, and that doesn't have to mean a drone with a gun. It could be a drone that just runs its propeller blades into your face. Like, it, it, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be a giant weapon system. Anything can be dangerous, particularly if the, uh, you know, robot presses the wrong button, right? Or the button. That, yeah. you know, so so just to be the, the, the level of awareness, I think people people are often uh, afraid of and, and, and looking at the wrong thing, right? They look at the drone with the gun and they go, that's the problem. But they would say, well, I'm, it's my laundry robot. What's it going to do, right? But it well, keeps asking about Sarah <clears throat> Connor. And nobody's right, yeah, sure exactly. why. So it's this, this idea that we, we're applying human-like, you know, anthropomorphic uh, concepts to these things. And we make the robots look like us because the world's built for us now. And we want them to be able to move through the world like us. And so by default, our evolutionary thinking is that we, you know, we're talking to a chat, a chat uh, AI and it sounds human. So I'm going to attribute human-like um concepts to it like empathy and you know like all and so and then because all our behavior detection algorithms in here are built for that evolutionarily to try to determine oh this person is trustworthy because they're saying these things and you know we have lie detectors built in and we have all these things built in but they're gonna they're totally misappropriated and and ill-suited for this this new future um but people are gonna do it they're gonna hook it up to stuff i mean right when chat gpt came out and i had my first conversation with it i was like People are going to hook this up to robots. I guarantee it. Like <laughs> the, one of the most surprising things for me is the number of people who are telling me that they are using full self-driving mode on their Tesla, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, I don't even think it's technically supposed to be full self-driving, right? It's supposed to be I don't think so. driver assist. But, <clears throat> yeah. you know, you've had instances in the news of people, you know, taking naps, right? They have photos yeah, of yeah. people taking naps, people texting on their phone, doing all sorts of distracting things. Mm -hmm. um, I have people telling me who own Teslas that they're doing stuff like this. And what surprises me about that is I, I have a Tesla Model 3. I don't use that. I've never been tempted mm -hmm. to use that, right? The benefits of the vehicle have, for me, have nothing to do with the fact that it can drive itself. And to be honest, based on where computers are at, I don't think I trust it yet, you know? Yeah, so. I, I totally am into the idea of um, assisted driving. I That's the only reason I want a Tesla is so that if I have to drive on the highway, I can get in the middle lane and say, go. For the next 30 miles, just stay in this lane. There's no complicated mergers. There's no co no people trying to pass. Like, just stay in the lane for 30 miles because it takes an, a, a mental load off me. Even if I have to sit there and just watch, like, and I'm not like doing this. It's the same as being a passenger in the car where it's like <clears throat> fundamentally different. And especially in, in bumper to bumper where it's traffic, that will kill my enthusiasm for life faster than anything. <laughs> I just hate that, that being, uh, and you don't have to manage everything. And it's very high mental load for not a lot of payoff and finally get through the traffic. So in those scenarios, I'm like, yeah, go for it. Um, the car, I, I don't think that the weaknesses of the car's driving systems are valid in those scenarios, right? It's like trying to drive in city traffic, trying to determine like lane changes, <clears throat> trying to determine if there's cars yeah. entering the thing or pedestrians. They, but on the highway, which is where I, I care about driving the least, like, you know, just get me the, from this entrance point, this on-ramp to this off-ramp. And that's that's where I would be wanting to use that technology. But, you know, people choose to abuse technologies all the time or put their tr unfounded trust in technologies. Um, and it's the same kind of thing to me as like, if you use spell check to fix your work and not learn how to spell, you're using it wrong. If you're using GPS to, to tr do the thing for you and not learn your way around a city, um, you're doing it wrong in my opinion. Right. And, but, but that's the majority, majority of people, um, just lean on the technology more than they should. Um, they, they disabuse themselves of needing to do anything, um, uh, or improve themselves from, through the technology. So yeah, it's not surprising people are doing that and there's always going to be consequences. And I only hope that the consequences that are wrought from doing that are on them only, and they don't run over a family. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense.
Well, Emil, on that note, let me thank you so much for your time today. We sure. really barely scratched the surface of the possibilities. There, there are so many things, you know. But we we did touch on pina coladas. That is the yeah, high yeah. point of the day for me. I don't yeah, but... drink, so I'll get a virgin <laughs> one. But but sure. nonetheless, I'm still excited about that idea. So... Yeah, if somebody could figure out how to get over that hump, how we can continue to ride this 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 wave, economic wave, and get over that hump, so that the machines can just do everything, and we don't need to worry about compensation or money in any of that scheme. That's the mystery for humanity. Yeah. Emil, thank you again so much for your time sure. today, sir. All right. See ya.